Greetings all. Very important little piece of data centric video today. And a lot of people have written to me about the latest BBC article going through all cause mortality. So I thought I'd go through that article and just pick out the actual data and actually explain it and interpret it. So I'm really careful these days because of massive censorship over the past year or two. And of course, my more controversial analyses are over on odyssey.com, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. Just search for my name. Um, but here I'm just going to go through published government data on mortality and I'm going to be very careful not to tread into any questioning of medical uh, data whatsoever. So this is completely clean, but it's just looking at the data and I think it would be very helpful for people who have seen this mass distribution of the BBC article on WHO kind of mortality analysis reports and uh, just to add some context and insight into the actual numbers. So enjoy and here we go. So here's the article again, loads of people writing to me asking me to have a look at the data. So here we go and we'll just stick to the data as always. So here's one of the first parts of it and it shows maybe more like 15 million excess deaths out of the world's seven and a half, whatever billion people. Whereas the COVID badged PCR positive deaths were only 5.4. So the number's higher for excess death. Also, they show that male is higher than female, but then again, males are more prone to insulin resistance and that greatly impacts the immune system. So it's not too surprising. Here's uh, the first piece in the article, and you'll notice that they say that these deaths counted now from excess mortality were not directly because of COVID necessarily, but instead caused by its knock-on effects. I'm talking about hospital access and all that kind of stuff, okay? What I'd say for that is um, these calculations include all lockdown policy-related deaths. We won't get into the numbers, but they include all of these. And there's a lot of publications coming out around these now and have been since 2020. So that's interesting. Uh, they also say this piece here, but what I pull out from it because it says the majority of the extra 9.5 million uh, are kind of assumed to be related to COVID. What I see here is they said that and were thought to be. Uh, that's about the extent of the science. So there you go. Now, this piece here, a staggering number, honoring the lives. All life loss is tragic, but still we have to have perspective and proportionality, right? But what I take from this is we need to hold policymakers accountable. Well, I'd certainly concur with that, but not in the way that they would think. If we don't count the dead, we'll miss the opportunity to be better prepared next time. Well, again, I'd agree, be better prepared, but my thoughts would be more in line with following traditional Western pandemic guidelines, like 2019 WHO, which Sweden largely followed. So that would be my opinion on it for what it's worth. Now, here's the numbers. We love the numbers. So this is the next table and it shows the deaths per 100,000. I usually use deaths per million, but no worries, in selected countries. Now, what jumps out at me from this? Because I'm a numbers guy. Well, Peru and Brazil jump out as a pair. Now, why is that? Well, I'll show you why these two countries jump out at me. Because... In September 2020, I was highlighting Peru and Brazil specifically in my talks. We saw Italy getting hit pretty hard seasonally for Northern Europe in this period. And then we saw Peru and Brazil getting hit in a more southern tropical area pattern. You know, there's strong seasonality here, which is acknowledged by everyone now. But you'll notice that Peru had a militaristic style hard lockdown from back here. It was extraordinary. It was being reported on widely. Uh, incredible lockdown. And Brazil famously did very little lockdown, just some local regional stuff. But the president, Bolsonaro, I think, didn't agree with lockdown. So they effectively didn't do it. So we have a no real lockdown country coming in back then, September, it was clear, with a lower mortality than the ultra hard lockdown Peru in the same region with the same types of peoples right? Now that tells you something straight away. And sure enough, we've seen, as I just shown, Brazil is less in all-cause mortality excess too. A lot less, like around a third, 
with no lockdown. So the other note I'd make, and I made it back in 2020, Brazil was found in the human sewage in 2019. And the paper's here, so it's published, right? So the virus was present, but again, seasonal triggering is very important for this and the influenza type viruses particularly. Uh, so there you go. So that's an extra little bit of data on Brazil. Now we'll go back to the table. We'll have another look at the data. And we see UK is 109 and I put a question mark. Now, why do I do that? I put a question mark because the UK was very hard hit in European terms. They have a very aged demographic, just like Sweden, and they have very poor metabolic health, not quite like Sweden. So 109 per 100,000, and that's around 0.1% excess mortality. This figure doesn't sound very high because flu in the past hard flu seasons were being bandied about to be in that region and pretty much were demonstrated seasonally to have humps like that. So you could say this is in the envelope of a severe flu season, as uh, Dr. John Lee in the UK has been saying on mass media since uh, summer 2020. I think it's a fair cut. And it's also lines up with what Professor Michael Levitt, Nobel Prize winner, and Professor John Ioannidis of Stanford, one of the most celebrated epidemiologists and scientists in the world, they were talking around 0.15% of impact from this virus based on Diamond Princess and serological studies. So the article from BBC is breathless and sensationalist, I think it's fair to say, but the actual numbers are in line with what we're talking about in 2020, in fairness. Global average, similar point, around 0.1% excess mortality. And remember that these include as the WHO pointed out themselves, they do include lockdown and other massive policy implementations and the impact that they have on mortality. So that's all included in this point one. In fairness, I'm pointing that out and it's absolutely valid. Sweden. Now, Sweden, we're going to do a few slides on because Sweden is very important. With no lockdowns, no masks and kids up to 16 in school, documented and public knowledge that is, they had one of the lowest impacts in Europe. And the latest data from Professor Levitt, if you properly compare with prior years and account for everything, it's arguable that the whole two year pandemic period does really negligible excess mortality in Sweden when you roll it all up and the humps are leveled by deficits. So Sweden is crucial as a control country, as many of you will know. So let's look at Sweden. The Telegraph, 5th of May 2022, I'm only talking mainstream guys, they noted Sweden's COVID death rate is the lowest in Europe, among the lowest, despite not having the restrictions. So it's in the Telegraph, so no need to censor here, right? Mainstream. And I shared this back, it's perfectly legitimate from the Swedish statistics government database, the link is there. Johan Hellstrom shared this, and I did too. And it shows the April Corona spike in the peak, and it also goes up to May 21. Some people thought this didn't show the full spike, but no, it shows the monthly. So there it is. You can see that it's not too dissimilar from flu seasons in the prior decades in terms of mortality spike, and it's tiny compared to the Spanish flu impact. And remember, in fairness, that the average age here is around 80, so the life years lost are very limited, but the average age for Spanish flu deaths was around 30, right? And infants died, and young mothers and young fathers were the median or the main block of people who died. So the life years lost here are massive, stratospheric compared to here. So let's be honest, this is government data and we're just calling out visually the reality, very different from the tone of the BBC article. Uh, just mentioning, I showed this in September 8, 2020, in fairness, for what it's worth. So here's a new version. Just today, I see Professor Freedom has great analysis and he's just showing the same data again. But you can see here the 19 had a very soft death rate. You know, a lot of aged frail would have maybe survived to the following year, 2020. Otherwise, they might not have. And 2020 is a spike and then 21 is back down in line. So these dynamics are quite obvious. And again, 
you can compare them to prior years here. You know, it puts it in perspective. I called out in September 2020 as well that Sweden had a trough or a deficit in mortality, very notable, before they got hit when SARS-CoV-2 triggered. So again, a lot of the hit does relate to this trough or low mortality in the run-up period. But notably, Finland and Norway don't show the same seasonality strength as Sweden, and they did not have a trough in the 19 into early 20 season. So you would not expect to see as much impact, and you don't. I showed this in our movie, covidchroniclesmovie.com. You can get it for free and download it. Um, It's all there. And this is a sequence we showed. And basically, Sweden has an average death rate of 9,200 per million per year because it's an aged demographic like the UK. And you see 2019 had a strong deficit or lack of people passing, a very soft flu season. And just interestingly, you can kind of transfer that across and see that there's an excess in 2020. So by all means, of course, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is a nasty virus. That's fine. That's reality. We can't get away from that. But it's very important to understand the dynamics as to why certain countries had certain levels of impact. And this one for Sweden is very illustrative. So there was also a paper in 2020 showing 16 reasons, possible reasons for Sweden's high death rate among the Nordics. And the big one was the one I just mentioned, the soft prior season, which prepped for a bigger impact in 2020. But there were lots more reasons as well. So this was published and there was another paper at the same time and it showed the same phenomenon that Sweden had a big stock of potentially susceptible people in the run up to 2020 and then commensurate got a pretty big hit relatively. But Finland, Denmark and to a large extent, Norway did not have the same stock built up of susceptible. So there were lots of papers published on this. And um, I mean, that's it. This is the data. Also, people might say, oh, but Sweden really did kind of lock down. Well, I have a lot of people in Sweden who fed me the reality. But better still, CNN went there in May, just in the epidemic and videoed it. And here's a clip I'll show you now. This is CNN, you know, this is not Ivor, this is CNN, here we go. To visit Sweden now is to enter a strange land where people can just hang out together, seek shelter from the cold in cozy restaurants, go for a drink or a coffee. It's been crowded all over, all the bars and restaurants and so on. You can shop for fashion and beauty products or even allow a hairdresser to invade your personal space. Sooner or later, I will have get Corona, I think, so. You've accepted that that will happen? Yeah. Elementary and middle schools are still open, while most high school students and college students study at home. So there we have it. And here's some snips from the video. You know, you can see how life was in the middle of the pandemic's most severe wave. That's reality. It's on CNN, guys. There's no lying or spin here, in fairness. And also in September, I was sharing pictures that people sent me and even crowded like transport, no masks. And they were all telling me in Sweden, yeah, by September 2020, everything was gone. And there were some token political efforts to show restrictions in the second wave at the end of 2020. But this was the reality that persisted throughout the winter. And again, these were photos sent to me a couple of weeks later, like when their actual wave had started. I leave you to make your own interpretations of the extent to which Sweden locked down themselves, even though there was no official lockdown. Right. So coming to the end of the article, BBC article now, and they say countries with low excess mortality rates included China. Right. I'd be a little careful, you know, believing all that data. And they talk around zero COVID, of course, as if that's the reason. And Australia, which had a really hard 2019 flu season, that was a huge spike and people didn't understand it. So there's some question marks around Australia. But again, we won't make a judgment. But then they mentioned Japan as an example. And I thought, "Uh oh, guys, you've just stood in a bear trap. And the reason is that Japan did beat the coronavirus impacts without lockdowns or mass testing. And this is Time, right, back in late 2020, Time magazine, 
by mainstream. And they talk about they weren't even mass testing. They didn't have lockdowns. Hairdressers stayed open, blah, 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 like, like Sweden, I guess. And uh, they didn't get hit. So this article went on to muse on why and came out with quite a lot of rubbish, really. But still and all, here it is. But the key thing is, and I shared this in September 2020 also, this crucial study. Because in this study, they tested across 11 or 13 regions of Tokyo and they kept serially testing with PCR and antibody a cohort or group of people to see what was happening and what was happening in the population in Tokyo. Well, across June and July in their bigger wave, PCR testing positives went right up to significant levels, right? High percentages. So Japan were getting transmission all over the place, right? This data is unquestionable. And zero prevalence, as the months went by, they got up to nearly 50% with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So the population got massively spread with no lockdowns and, and no real restrictions. But the thing is, they didn't really get an impact. So Japan is, like Sweden, an exemplar of what was actually happening. And the publication is here. It's published. You can look it up. No need to censor me here. That was September 2020. That data was shared by me and many others, but no one wanted to know for whatever reason. One reason might be they didn't get impacted. They have an extraordinary low incidence of vitamin D deficiency versus Europe, etc. There are studies there on that. And we know from the recent Israeli study and many more, which are published, which are published, that 10 to 14 times more impact in severity or mortality from COVID related to people who have metabolic issues, i.e. they have a low vitamin D. So that's just a potential, one of the reasons. I'm not saying that's the whole thing at all. And also we have, and this was published in September 2020, BMJ, you know, prior immunity in certain regions don't make people immune totally and won't make antibodies, but they do reduce the impact because the immune system in certain regions has more heads up and quicker response to new viruses that are similar to old ones. So that's another potential reason. But the key thing is, and this is the crucial thing, that it went like wildfire through Tokyo. It's just the impact was really low. That's the key thing. So Japan being used as an example of lockdown working, ah, the opposite actually, the very opposite. So I'm going to give you a quick clip here now from a very famous person who's spoken at length about the pandemic. You could question the credentials, etc., or medical credentials, but anyway, fair is fair, spoken at length. And this tweet just today or yesterday came out and I'll show you the video clip of the same person acknowledging what we've been saying since 2020, it would appear. I'll let you be the judge. Here's the clip. That experts at the foundation said, there's no way, you know, this, there's been too much uh, travel without diagnosis uh, for us to contain this. And then at that point, we didn't really understand the fatality rate. You know, we didn't understand that it's a fairly low fatality rate and that it's a disease mainly of the elderly, kind of like flu is, although a bit different than that. Well, there you go. Funny how after a year or two of kind of scaremongering in the extreme across the board by everyone, that now this will be admitted. But in general, and I'm now going to finish with a clip from our movie, covidchroniclesmovie.com. It's free there. And in this clip, I talk about the revisionism, that after this is over, we're going to see enormous revisionism and trying to go back and say that things worked that didn't really and just put a, a spin on the whole thing in retrospect, even as the data comes out to show we made huge mistakes across the Western world and put in measures that had no real efficacy or effectiveness and caused huge collateral damage. It, that's being published widely on now. But I did suggest in the movie, predict that we'd see all kinds of articles trying to tell us uh, the opposite. So, Here's the clip and I'll finish with this. 
And as always, guys, huge appreciation for the people who support me through PayPal and Patreon. Uh, keeps me analyzing, getting the data out there, you know, more correct interpretations without kind of corporate or media bias. So really appreciate that. And anyone who can continue to support, that's huge for me. And of course, new people coming across my material, maybe consider so if you have the means. Uh, greatly appreciated. So thank you.